Hi, I'm Ralph Demetrius, and welcome to Wine Country at Work. Something that comes up for a lot of people today is how much is climate change affecting us? Now, we live in wine country. All we talk about is food, wine, and weather. But when we talk about weather, we're serious about it because it has to do with how well our crops do. And our main crop, of course, is the wine grape. And the wine grape, depending upon which varietal it is, now varietal means, like, is it Chardonnay, is it Pinot Noir, is it Cabernet, those are different varietals, they like different climates. So when you decide where you're going to put your grapes, it has a lot to do with what's the climate in that area. So people have little weather stations that they put up in the vineyards to track these things. And this is not a new topic here. You see, I remember going to a, a wine writers conference, I think it was 2007, and the Vintners Association of Napa had actually commissioned a study about climate in the Napa Valley and how was it changing? Because they needed to know where were they going to put their vineyards? What were they going to plant in the different vineyards? And I'll tell you, I, no, one thing I heard recently was that a very well-known winery, in fact, they own four wineries in this region, have sold off all of their Napa vineyards. Now, Napa are the top and their most expensive vineyards in America. And they had sold off all of their vineyards. They were buying all their grapes from other people within Napa. And I just heard recently that they had just purchased vineyards up in Oregon. Now, what's different between Napa Valley and Oregon? Oregon's a lot cooler. In fact, primarily in Oregon, they grow Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Why? It's further north. These varietals that originally came from Europe came from different regions, and some place like Burgundy is quite far north than France, and north of that is Champagne. Well, the grapes you use for Champagne are the same ones as you find in Burgundy, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Pinot Noir has a relatively thin skin. Chardonnay's skin is thicker, but it's a light skin, so these grapes do better when it's cooler. Napa's Cabernet country, Bordeaux is much further south, it needs a lot more heat. So these people must be looking at it and saying, you know, it's going to get a little too hot here for Cabernet in the future, and we will need to start moving our vineyards closer to the coast and further north. I remember um, going to a winery recently that specialized in Pinot Noir, and years ago they had gone off to the Russian River Valley and started planting there. Pinot Noir in Russian River Valley is considered generally some of the best in the country. I was at their tasting room recently, and they said that the Pinot Noir from the Russian River Valley was actually the warmest place that they sourced their grapes from now. Now, it's not that it's real hot there, but in comparison to Anderson Valley up in Mendocino, north of Sonoma and closer to the coast, um, up in the uh, vineyards of Oregon and Seattle, those are much cooler. So we're very conscious of these changes that are going on. And we actually see it personally too because one of the things that's always important to wine aficionados is the vintage. How was that year? You know, you watch the old James Bond movies and he'll be commenting upon a particular vintage, you know, from a, oh, that was a wonderful vintage. And all this wine was obviously from, you know, the eastern side of the vineyard, you know. How do you know that stuff? Well, you know, you can actually know that stuff if you drink enough wine, I guess. And spies apparently drink a lot of wine, or at least drink a lot, especially in those days. This is a big issue because for us, not every year is the same. And you see, I always oftentimes joke that the reason the French hate us is that in Bordeaux, they normally get two to three good years out of ten. I mean, really good years where the wines are spectacular. In Napa and Sonoma, we normally get about seven good years out of ten, and the three years that aren't good aren't that bad. But since just going back to 2010, it's been very unusual. First of all, since 2010, it has rained in July and in August in Napa. I know people who grew up here who have never seen it rain in July or August in their entire lives. It just had never rained on those months. Normally throughout the year, it would be about 80 degrees, an average of 80 degrees. Maybe one time a year it would spike up over to 100, right? 
This year, 2017, we've had multiple spikes over 100 that extended for multiple days. Now, going back to 2010, it was a very cool year. It was very, very cool. They had, some people couldn't harvest because it was just too cool. Throughout the region, it caused a lot of problems over in um, Russian River Valley because they were having a hard time getting the grapes to ripen, so they started trimming away extra leaves to get more sun on, on the grapes, and that's a lot of work. And then what happens, they get hit with two very, very hot days, and it sunburned the grapes, and they lost about 30%. 2011 was even cooler, and a lot of people suffered, and the harvest was down 30 to 50%, depending on where you were, because it was simply so cool. You can't make wine if you can't make enough alcohol, and the way you make alcohol is to have that grape produce enough sugar. Grapes are fantastic at creating sugar. Now, those were two relatively wet, very cool years. And then we got 2012. And 2012 was spectacular. I had a friend, uh, Joe Benziger, said to me, this is the vintage of a lifetime. And it was, it was amazing. In fact, you could smell the grapes um, in the bins 20 feet away when they were being harvested. It was beautiful. Then 13 was just as good. And why was 12 and 13, why were they so good? This was the worst drought in California history. It went on from 12, 13, 14, and 15. And these were four spectacular vintages. Why? Wine grapes like it dry. Everyone else in California is freaked out because of the dry weather, and the, the wine growers are thinking, this is fantastic. But these are the these were the, this was the worst drought in California history. 2013 was the driest year in this region's history. It was amazing. I mean, there was one bit of, little bit of rain. I mean, we barely had a green season. Our green season, there's our winter season. Then 14 was also very dry. 15 was dry, and of course we had rain at exactly the wrong time, which was during the springtime, when it rained right during flowering, and it washed the pollen off the flowers, and we got what's called shatter, where the grapes don't, the bunches don't come out completely. So it was down about 30%, but the fruit that did come out was beautiful. And then we had the next year, 16, which turned out to be very wet. And the winter from 16 over to 17 was the wettest year in California history. And we had tons and tons of flooding. And normally the downtown would have been flooded. Downtown Napa would have been flooded. These are not your normal Napa years. Norm Napa's, used, Napa's summer used to boring weather. You get to the summertime and it's beautiful every single day. And now we've had a whole series of years from 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 that have been extraordinary. And of course, as we also know, we are encountering the hottest years worldwide ever. Now people say, oh, well, climate change is not caused by human behavior. Well, consider this. From the year that my grandmother arrived in America, the, the youngest of my four grandparents, actually not the youngest, but the one of the three that arrived from Italy, 1901 to now, the population has gone from 1.6 billion people, a lot of people, to 7 billion people. Just the metabolism, just the heat that comes off of that many people, just the all the different things that we create, all the cooking stoves, all of the electronics, all of the cars, you think that's not going to have an influence? You think that we're not going to have to move our vineyards and our plants to someplace cooler where they can thrive? It's not rocket surgery. This is what happens when you have a lot of people. Why did it develop? Because of the mass production of grains. When you can feed that many people, they have more babies. How do you change that? Well, that's government policy. But if people wonder, is this really climate change? You gotta trust the grape growers because they always, they always know. So, hope that's helpful. That's my particular perspective from here in wine country. Wine country at work is very much about the wine tour industry. You know, wine tourism is its own little category within the tourism industry, which is a huge industry, but wine tourism is interesting because it's primarily adults. People don't bring children to wine country. But it's also interesting to see how it's shifted. And there's no place where this is more obvious than in Napa. 
And that's because Napa is the top wine destination in the world. It gets way more people than most other regions. The only one that compares is Sonoma, which is right next door. And in fact, the two are the yin-yang of wine country. What's happened in the last four to five years? Well, one thing that's very interesting, and we're in this industry ourselves, the, the transportation industry, is that in California, they've gone from about 6,000 limousine companies to about 3,500. That's quite a drop. Why? Because of ride sharing. Things like Lyft and Uber have just devastated not only the limousine companies, but also the taxi companies. What do you expect? You, you, know, you suddenly have all these regulations that have been in place for years to make sure that transportation is safe, and then suddenly you bypass that with these ride companies that are much cheaper and more flexible. And in truth, most of the people who do ride sharing up here in wine country don't know the area. They drive in from outside the area, but people, you know, they come up for the weekend from San Francisco or the Bay Area. They figure they can save a little money here or there and not drive themselves. So it's completely, you know, reasonable. But what it's done to the industry is interesting. The number of guides and professionals in the field has shrunk. The amount of work for them has shrunk. And that has a kind of an interesting manifestation. The people who the top guys work with are the concierges and the very small wineries. Right? And realize there's a lot more small wineries than there are big wineries. In other words, when you go up through Highway 29 in Napa or Highway 12 in Sonoma, you're going up past the biggest wineries. You know, people like Cake Bread and Mondavi and Sterling and Costello and these big ones. Well, they're very easy to get to. And if you're using a ride share system where you depend upon an app and a phone, people can get there and they can leave again. The little wineries, of which make up most of the family wineries in Napa, are tucked away down little roads, gravel roads, tucked up in the hills that the guides know about. Well, if the industry shifts from private guides to these rideshare systems, where do they go? Where do the rideshare people go? They go along the main routes. One of the things that's been fascinating to me, and not in a happy way, is that for years with these small wineries, you really had to plan way in the head to get in there. You know, they only have a certain amount of staff, and you know, if they were tied up, they were tied up. Now you go to these places, it's, it's like they're ghost towns. People just aren't going there. Why? Because the people who are coming up are using rideshare. They're going to the big wineries, and there aren't as many guides to go to the small wineries. So these little family wineries have been suffering because they've lost many of their best advocates. Now, who else has suffered? The concierges. Why? Because the concierges have always depended upon the tour guides and the tour companies to pay commissions. You know, a concierge is essentially a, a front desk person. But the reality is, they're the front desk person who is the expert. They're the ones who really know all of the restaurants, all of the wineries, all of the golf courses, all the special attractions. You know, who do you have to call to get into French Laundry at the last minute and see if there's a cancellation? What's the special phone number? Who, who do you have to call to get into Harlan Estate when they don't see people unless you're on their list? Who do you have to call? They're the experts. But the hotels, they don't pay them like they're experts. They depend upon commissions. Well, when there's a lot fewer tour companies and people like Lyft and Uber, they don't pay commissions. What happens to the concierges? Suddenly they find their income dropping by 30 40%. And the amount of high quality service that they can do for their clients and for their hotel goes down. Many of them will just leave the field. Or they continue to work in the field and just get used to less money. But they will do less work as a result. So the overall level of quality of service in the valley has gone down. 
the transportation has gone down, the amount of business going to these small, really interesting and unique wineries, the amount of traffic to them has gone down. But who's booming? All the wineries along the main routes and all the ride shares. So all the stuff that makes the valley really unique and interesting and a home to people, people who have a passion for wine and for the wine culture, that's what's really suffering. And who's doing great? The big international corporations, they, they love it. They're getting lots and lots and lots of business. Now, one of the things that's also happened is that the millennials love wine country. Why? Because it's social. Wine country is a place you go with a bunch of your friends. You descend upon a place, you get to go tasting and drinking and things like that. And the millennials are really funny that they will pay for the expensive tasting. Why? Because their parents were wine lovers and their parents introduced them to great wines. So they want to go taste the really, really good wines. But they don't buy. Why? Because you know, they don't have stable homes, they're still moving, they don't have that kind of income. They'll go do the expensive tasting and maybe buy one bottle. Now, the wine tourism was built on the boomers, biggest popular, you know, biggest generation in history. The boomers will go do the normal tasting and then they'll buy a case. And you have to remember, wineries are first and foremost a place where they sell you wine. That's their job. You know, you don't have to tip the person pouring you wine. What they want you to do is buy some bottles because they're salespeople. That's where they make their money. That's their purpose. Millennials don't do that. So what happened? And it was the same thing that happened during the recession. People were coming to taste but not buying. So they had to raise their tasting fees to cover the price of the wine they were pouring for people because they weren't making the money on the sales. Now, with the millennials coming in, it's even worse. They've raised the tasting fees again. It's not uncommon in Napa to find $50 tasting fees. That's without a tour. $75, $100, $100 with a tour. You know, I mean, you go out with four people to a tasting, you just spend $400 on one winery. When I started in this field a dozen years ago, five and $10 tasting fees were normal. Even that very good wineries. Uh, I remember the most visited winery in the world, Visatui, didn't even have a tasting fee. They just gave you the wine. They figured you're going to buy something or you're going to buy food because they had a big deli inside. They're one of the only ones with a deli inside because they're on a commercial zone and so they're allowed to have a deli inside where everyone else isn't because they're in the agricultural reserve. This is how it shifted. This has made the whole area more expensive. And at the same time, because the hotels see the tasting fees go up, the hotels have all raised their prices too. And for the people in the tour industry and the people in the hospitality industry that fill these specialized service areas, these areas that require expertise, are being squeezed because the hotels are so expensive, the wineries are so expensive, people are not wanting to spend money on that expertise, they'd rather go on their apps and look things up and then call their, the ride share to, the, the ride share to get them there and save money so they can spend, you know, for the $1,000 hotel room and the $200 worth of tasting fees. One of the things that's happened as a result of this is excessive traffic. Why? Because as compared to a tour driver that goes from picks the clients up, drives them to the first winery and sits there, the people from Uber and Lyft go like this. They're continually in motion. They're always driving around. It's, it's bizarre the amount of traffic you have to deal with in wine country. And you have to realize in Napa, there's only two lane roads above Yonville. In Sonoma too, in the Sonoma Valley, it's all two lane roads. There's no four lane roads in the in the Sonoma Valley, up in Russian River Valley, it's all windy roads. Alexander Valley, the same thing, windy two-lane roads. They weren't designed for this much traffic and the infusion of Uber and Lyft from the East Bay that descend upon us are just clogging the roads. So it means that rather than having one driver to drive you around all day, you know, if someone wants to go to three, four wineries, they're gonna have three or four drivers. Yeah. 
and everything is shifting and people get stranded at wineries all the time because they decide to go up a hill to get to the top of the hill, they get dropped off, the driver goes away and then they try to get the app to work, the app doesn't work up on the hill. So the poor, poor person working at the winery has to drive them down to the bottom of the hill. It's amazing how many times I see people walking out to Highway 29 because they can't get service 200 yards up the road at the winery. So it really has shifted in weird ways. But you know, I've been in business since I'm 16 years old, which was a very long time ago, admittedly. And one of the things I have learned in business is that things are always changing. And this is a particularly odd type of change, but there it is. We're working on a series of shows about biodynamics. It's a type of organic agriculture that developed right after the First World War as a reaction to the chemical agriculture that emerged from all these chemicals left over from the trench warfare. And we've been researching this for several years, mm -hmm. and recently we've started working with the organization, at least in terms of talking with them, that does the certification for this. And it's been very revealing, the things you find out. See, biodynamic, it's a wonderful name, first of all. It was coined by Rudolf Steiner, the great uh, philosopher in Europe. And it's about the energy that comes out of the natural world. And it talks about things like how to time when you do your picking, how to time when you move your wine from barrel to barrel, how to how to resolve issues in the vineyards by using other plants in terms of homeopathic formulas. It's just a great system. It's really about living in true harmony with nature and then using the tools in nature to get the best results. But like all things human, when you get into it, there's all kinds of divisions. And one of the big differences, I think, is between the certification organizations that say, well, these are the ones who are doing it. And these people are not really doing it. Well, why aren't they doing it? Well, because they're not certified. Something you learn in the natural health field, or in the healing field generally, that sometimes certification comes with limitations because you have to really stick by that criteria. And there's apparently a fair number of wineries that were certified at one time or another and then kind of stopped, let it lapse. Maybe they didn't want to be that tied to it. In fact, there's true with organic or agriculture oftentimes in this region that people will be organic yet they won't seek out the organic label because they want to be prepared to do something if they have to but it's also they may not want the organic label because of how it affects their marketing so when you're in a business like this where there's marketing there's product there's you know the ethics of agriculture it gets complicated and one of the things I did find out in my conversations is how much biodynamics is actually used as a marketing tool that label this you know this highest level of agriculture and many times you have wineries who are saying well we do all this stuff with biodynamics but then you find out they don't actually make any biodynamic wine huh or they make five percent or ten percent of their wine is biodynamic well you know that means they have the ethic but not the commitment. And you wonder about that. No, who most often does biodynamics is the very small wineries. See, many times the big wineries will talk about it, but when it comes down to the economics of how much land costs and how much it costs to farm and all the extra work that goes into it, they'll say, well, let's, let's you know, cut the corners here or there. But the small wineries, 1,000 cases, 500 cases of wine. Their home is right over there, right next to the vineyards. Right next to that house, that's their winery. Whatever happens out here in the vineyard and in the winery affects their health. They feel it personally. And there's nothing like feeling it personally to make you feel committed. And many times with these big companies, they're in these situations where you know, we have the ethic, but I'm not the one out in the vineyard. I'm not the person in the winery. That's in a different county, you know. So in terms of a business de you know, decision, you know, my, my uh, financial officer is saying, oh, you're spending too much on cow horns, or you're spending too much on silica, or do you really need to send your team in there to, you know, spray with, uh, you know, wild thistle, you know. 
Maybe not. Maybe we don't need to. We'll save a little bit of money here or there. So it's much easier for a big company to be less committed. And don't we see this in the big tech companies? It sometimes seems to me that the big tech companies are the most amoral companies you've ever seen because they're so anonymous. You know, if you go into a little store and you have an issue with the person at the store, you see them face to face. It's hard to you know, lie to a person or cheat a person when you're looking them in the eye and they're your neighbor. But with these big tech companies, with these big servers, they have God knows what on their servers. They don't know because it's so anonymous. And I think that idea of the very, very big companies and their tendency to, you know, do what is expedient rather than what is sustainable or moral is something you have to watch out with in food. And I think this is one of the reasons why these small wineries really deserve our, our patronage because it's these small wineries that have a very strong ethic about why are they accomplishing what they're accomplishing and guess what? See those plants right there? Those are the ones that we bring in and we put in the winery and there's our house and why don't you come over and we'll sit in the back porch and taste some wine. Now that's authentic. So we're working on the series about biodynamics. I think we're going to be talking with a lot of people from the little wineries and look forward in the coming episodes. So dark in the got a lot of sky because I don't want to get the front of the windshield wipers of the car. Don't worry, it's just for a television show.